Baseball continues their first place run and softball just keeps on winning. Track and field have a short meet canceled due to weather. Opening day is upon us while the Penguins hold on to a wild card spot. The NCAA has crowned their men's champion as playoff hockey and the Masters are on the horizon. It's time to come on down to the Pioneer sideline. Hello and welcome back to Pioneer Sideline. I'm your host, Natalia Hillen. Point Park University's baseball team played three games against Ohio Christian University at the Wild Thinks Park this past weekend and on Monday. Point Park had a huge and successful first game, winning 17-0, unfortunately took a loss in the second game 5-3, and won 10-6 on Monday. Some key highlights of the game were Macaulay Brito in the fifth, who drove in three runs and a pair on a two-run double. Jordan Campbell in the sixth, who was two for four with two RBIs and two runs. Carlos Martinez, who got four RBIs. Easton Klein, who pitched the first six innings scoreless. And Kenneth Rowland, where he pitched in inning seven and finished off the combined shutout. The game ended 17-0. Game two had the Pioneers down. In the third inning, Ohio Christian got five runs and held the lead for the rest of the game. Key players were Bryant Lung with a double and Carter Smith scoring the first run with a bunt, a walk, and a base hit. Starting pitcher Yoathan Rivera got a ground ball, but Point Park was struggling to get another out, which resulted in a third run scored. The Pioneers scored in two innings, and the Pioneers had an amazing start by the fifth inning, as Jordan Campbell walked and Jared Campbell got a two-run homer. The Trailblazers pitcher Tanner Pop pitched all seven innings and survived three walks and two batters and finally limited the hits to six. Point Park's Jared Campbell and Macaulay Brito were two for four, and Sebastian Rodriguez had three four innings of scoreless relief. In Monday's game, the Pioneers led throughout the entire game with heavy pitching from starter Javier Cardoso. Pioneers won their last game against Ohio Christian and ended the series 2-1. and one. In today's game, the Pioneers came back against WNJ. After being down 7-0 through three innings, the team battled back with two Justin Oakley home runs and a Jared Campbell Grand Slam winning 15-10. The Pioneers are 21-8 overall and 13-2 in the RSC. The Pioneers are back at it on Friday against IU Southeast at home. Switching gears over to the Point Park University softball team, they had a winning weekend and played two games against Alice Lloyd College this past weekend. The Pioneers won both games 12-1 and 5-2. In game one, some key players were Angelie Bial, who was two for three with a homer and five RBIs and pitched the first four innings. Melanie Taylor, Cameron Meyer, and Bial had two hits and two runs each, and Alex Bondi was two for three. Point Park was leading 3-0 after a few hits and errors, and in the second inning, four more runs came in and Bial got a three-run homer. In the fourth inning, Sydney Reese got an RBI double, Meyer got a sacrifice fly, and Bial with an RBI single, with a final score of 12-1. In game two, the key player was Jada Simon, who pitched the entire game with only letting two runs in on four hits. Another key player, Sydney Reese and Simon, were leading the offense by going two for three at the plate. In the second inning, two hits and two errors made by Alice Lloyd helped Point Park take the lead 3-0. Remy Coy had a ground out and Melanie Taylor got the last two runs of the inning. Point Park took the lead 32 and in the fourth and fifth innings. And Simon and Gianna Welsh had base hits starting the inning. The final score was 5-2 Point Park. The Pioneers are 8-8 eight eight overall and 5-3 in the RSC. They played Rio Grande this past Monday and will be playing at St. Mary of the Woods College on Thursday, April 6th. Good luck, Pioneers. After the break, we'll hear from Hannah Bizet about how the track team did this past weekend. Stay tuned.
Welcome back. Now we send things to Hannah Bazay to recap us on the West Liberty invite. Hannah? Thanks, Nat. The men's and women's track teams traveled to West Liberty State College, where they competed in the Tim Weaver Track and Field Invitational. Unfortunately, due to the poor weather conditions, the meet was cut short. However, the team still held their own in what they could compete in. Starting off with our men's team, in the men's 100 meters, Demir Lomax took third with his time of 11.42 seconds. Jacorius Demps took fifth at 11.56 seconds, and Peter Durando got 10th with his time of 11.85 seconds. In the 110 hurdles, Jonah Hartman took 11th place, Point Park's highest placement for that event. In long jump, Damir Stewart took first with his mark of 6.79 meters, and right behind him was Maxwell Good, who placed second with his mark of 6.67 meters. Finally, Point Park's throwers showed out, with all three of them placing in the top 10. Siobhan Fletcher got the highest score, taking fourth, Cooper Lytle took ninth, and Daniel Jacobs came in at 10th. Collectively, the men's team got 36 points before the meet was canceled, putting them at fourth place out of the 12 teams that competed. Moving on to our women's team, in the women's 100 meters, three pioneers placed in the top 15. Rakia Ellsbury got 12th with her time of 13.83 seconds, Hannah Bond came in at 13th with her time of 13.85 seconds, and right behind her was Jordan Yaniga, who got 14th place with her time of 13.90 seconds. Kiara Sawyers took home 4th place with her time of 5 minutes and 25.57 seconds in the women's 1500 meters. In the women's 100 hurdles, Ashanti Farron got 5th at 17.29 seconds and Anna Eisman placed 7th at 18.07 seconds. In the long jump, Carson Hetzler took 2nd place with her mark of 5.26 meters and Michaela Rice got 11th at 4.69 meters. Finally, in women's javelin, Maya Terza placed second with her mark of 36.26 meters, Point Park's highest mark in that event. The ladies managed to get 27 points to take home seventh place out of the 10 teams that competed. The next meet is scheduled to take place on Friday, April 7th and Saturday, April 8th, where hopefully the weather holds up. Congratulations to both the men's and women's track teams, and we can't wait to see how they do this weekend. Thanks, Hannah. Now let's hear from Jacob Kubik with an update on how the men's and women's golf teams did in the opening weekend of their season. Jacob? Thanks, Nat. The Point Park men's and women's golf teams' se spring seasons are officially underway. The men's team traveled to Grove City Country Club on Thursday, March 30th to kick off their season. Some of the other universities that competed against Point Park were St. Vincent, Clarion, Westminster, and Grove City, the tournament's host. As a team, the Pioneers finished 10th out of 11 teams, shooting a 346, 58 over par. That team score was just five shots behind the eighth place team score of 341 from Grove City's B team. Junior Anthony Santilli began his season with a 10 over par score of 82 and a tie of 26th individually. Santilli had one birdie, seven pars, nine bogeys, and a double bogey. Junior Tyler Hillard also shot a 10 over 82 and tied for 26th individually. His scorecard consisted of 10 pars, six bogeys, and two double bogeys. Freshman Tegan McTeague shot a 14 over 86 and landed in a tie for 42nd individually. He made one birdie, five pars, nine bogeys, and three double bogeys. Junior Jacob Kubik rounded out the team scoring with a 24 over par 96 and landed solo 61st individually. Kubik opened his day with a par one of four on the day and also made six bogeys, six double bogeys, and two triple bogeys. Ouch. On Sunday, April 2nd, Santilli, Hillard, and McTeague traveled to Avalon at Bull Park as individuals to compete in the Teal College Invitational. All three players improved their scores from the previous event. Santilli led the group with a five-over score of 75, putting him in a tie for eighth in the event. Hillard was not too far behind, only shooting one shot higher than Santilli with a 6-over 76, putting him in a tie for 10th. McTeague shot a 9-over par 79, putting him in a tie for 15th overall. The team's next event is the Westminster Invitational on eight, Monday, April 10th at the Avalon Field Club. Good luck. The women's team's first event was scheduled for April 1st, but was postponed due to inclement weather. It is unclear at the moment if they will reschedule the event. The ladies' next event will be the Westminster Invitational on Saturday, April 15th at the Avalon Field Club. Good luck. That's all I have. Back to you now. Thanks, Jacob. After the break, we get the inside scoop on all things local and national. Stay tuned. Yeah. 
Good evening and welcome to Newsnight. My name is Craig Verkowski. Tonight, Tonight, we'll cover all your international, national, and local news. Australia is one of the most biodiverse countries on the planet. Over 8,000 items are to be auctioned off at Pittsburgh International Airport on October 22nd. Last Thursday, the House Committee investigating the January 6th attack chose to subpoena former President Donald Trump. All this and more coming, coming up, up on, on Newsnight. Night. Welcome back. I'll be sending things back over to Hannah Bazay to update us on how all things are going locally and nationally. Hannah? Thanks, Nat. The Penguins are holding on to the second wildcard spot in the Eastern Conference while just barely being ahead of the Florida Panthers. The Pens are coming off a meaningful victory against the Flyers, led by Ricard Raquel, who scored two goals in this outing. However, the Pens have split their last eight games being 4-4, four and four, so they must step it up and win as many games as possible in their last five remaining games. Two of these games will be against the Blackhawks and the Blue Jackets, two teams on the weaker side. While the Devils and Wild will definitely be a tougher matchup for the Pens, hopefully the Pens pull out at least three or four of these games and secure their spot in the playoffs. In baseball news, with Major League season starting and the Pittsburgh Pirates' first couple games being complete, the Pirates started off opening day with a win over the Reds. Pirates' young star, O'Neill Cruz, was incredible hitting a home run to tie the game, then later hitting a sacrifice fly to give the Pirates the lead. David Bednor then came in to pitch and saved the game to give the Pirates an opening day victory. The next two games in the series against the Reds were not as good, however, losing 6-2, then 3-1. Both games were close for most of it, but some late home runs led to the Reds taking the series. However, the Pirates did bounce back strong and beat the Red Sox 7-6 lead by all-star outfielder, outfielder Brian Reynolds, who hit two home runs in the outing. This game had most of its runs scored in the first four innings, with David Bednar coming in late to record yet another save and securing a victory for the Pirates. The Pirates currently sit at 2-2 two two record as they continue their series against the Boston Red Sox. The NFL free agency has been quiet for a while, but the Steelers continue to make some noise. Patrick Peterson was a strong signing early in the season. The Steelers proceeded to sign DeMonta Kazee and Cole Holcomb. Later, the Steelers decided to part ways with linebacker Miles Jack. The most recent offseason news was the Steelers signing safety Keanu Neal. Neal is a veteran and will be a great addition to the Steelers this upcoming season. Now I'll send things over to Jacob Kubik for all things national. Thanks, Hannah. The men's national championship game for the NCAA was Monday between the San Diego State Aztecs and the Yukon Huskies, and this game was a solid battle from the beginning. After San Diego State made its first two three-pointers of the game, there was a feeling we might end up getting another high-level offensive performance from both teams. That didn't quite transpire in the first 20 minutes. The, Ag the Aztecs excuse me, went up 10-6 to early and then went more than 11 minutes without a made field goal, missing 14 shots in a row. UConn was able to push its lead to as many as 16 points, although San Diego State cut it to 12 at the end of the half, and UConn couldn't convert at the rim on the final possession. The Huskies were able to get opportunities in transition, pushing the ball after defensive rebounds and getting early offense against an unsettled San Diego State defense. San Diego State missed all of its five layup attempts and was outscored in the paint 16-6. In the second half, the Aztecs narrowed the UConn lead to five, but the Huskies responded with a knockout punch to boost the lead back to eight, and the Huskies never looked back from there. UConn junior center Adama Sanogo 
finished Monday's title game with 17 points and 10 rebounds after averaging 20.2 points and 9.8 rebounds in the first five games of the tournament. He was named the tournament's most outstanding player. UConn played 240 minutes in six tournament games and trailed for just 31 minutes of game time, which is 13% of the tourney, including only 55 seconds in the second half of the games alone. UConn won its six NCAA tournament games by an average of 20 points per game, the fourth largest average win margin since the field expanded to 64 teams in 1985. They finished the season 17-0 against non-conference opponents and won every game by 10-plus points. This is UConn's fifth tourney title in school history and cemented their season as one of the most dominant runs of all time in the NCAA tournament. In the NHL, Playoff spots are being clinched all over the league, and the final 16 teams in the league are starting to become a little clearer. In the Eastern Conference, the top 16 have already clinched a playoff spot. The Boston Bruins have already clinched the President's Trophy and the top spot in the East. The Toronto Maple Leafs and Tampa Bay Lightning have clinched the two and three seeds in the Atlantic Division and will play each other in the first round, although who has home ice advantage is still to be decided. In the Metropolitan Division, the Carolina Hurricanes hold a three-point lead over the second-place New Jersey Devils, and the New Jersey Devils hold a three-point lead on the third-place New York Rangers. All three of these teams have officially clinched a playoff berth already. In the wildcard race, the New York Islanders hold the first wildcard with 87 points with four games remaining. The hometown Pittsburgh Penguins hold the second wildcard with 86 points and five games remaining. And the Florida Panthers are on the, currently on the outside looking in, with 85 points and five games remaining. In the Western Conference, the top five teams have clinched a playoff spot. The Vegas Golden Knights, Los Angeles Kings, and Edmonton Oilers have all clinched playoff spots in the Pacific Division, with the one seed still up for grabs. In the Central Division, the Dallas Stars and Minnesota Wild have clinched a postseason berth. The defending cup champion Colorado Avalanche are two points behind both the Stars and the Wild, although they haven't clinched a playoff spot officially yet. The Seattle Kraken hold the first wildcard spot in the West, and the Winnipeg Jets have the last wildcard spot. With the Calgary Flames two points behind them, last week of the season is upon us. Let the chaos begin. Finally, golf fans rejoice. It is officially Masters Week. The eyes of the golf world moves to Augusta, Georgia for the 87th playing of the Masters Tournament at the Augusta National Golf Club. As they are every year, the storylines are endless. For the second time this season, five-time Masters champion Tiger Woods will tee it up in a feature group with Victor Hovland and Xander Shoffley. Seeking a Masters win to compete the career Grand Slam, Rory McIlroy will be teeing up with Tom Kim and Sam Burns. Defending champion Scotty Scheffler will be playing with Max Homa and the 2022 U.S. Amateur champion Sam Bennett. Who will be wearing the green jacket come Sunday afternoon? Only time will tell. That's all I have. Back to you now. Thanks, Jacob. After the break, we come back with the case of the week. Stay tuned. Feel the beat of nature at a park or forest near you. Find a forest and music inspired by nature at discovertheforest.org. Good morning, everyone, and welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back to Daybreak. Daybreak. Chicken Guy opened in PPG Place on Monday. The bridge would open before the one-year marks to check out the 20th annual gingerbread display. Share with you this week's Ray of Sunshine. We are still somehow hanging around in the playoff. It gives Georgia Democrats some hold onto the governing body. Are 200,000 people still in harm's way. This weather is perfect for those cozy nights indoors. Those given 12 seconds to remind you that if you're high, 
just don't drive. Because if you feel different, you drive different. It's illegal to drive high everywhere anyway. Welcome back. Pirates opening day is this Friday, and they currently sit at 2-2 two and, two and open at home against the White Sox. After seeing a few games, we're going to discuss how we think the remaining season will go. I am joined by Jacob and Ryan today to hear what they have to say. So first, guys, I want to ask you, how do you think the season is going in your personal opinion? I mean, I don't think it's going bad to start. I mean, it's only through four games, and you know, tonight they're playing their fifth game, so mm. I feel like it could be going worse. The offense has kind of showed up. Like, you know, they scored five games in their opener, and they scored seven last night against the Red Sox. So in their wins, they've scored 12 runs. I mean, it's good to see the offense show up. But whenever the offense hasn't shown up, we've lost. So it's kind of like kind of a give and take whether, you know, whether the pitching shows up or the hitting shows up. There's no kind of like in between. So I'm glad to see the offense, at least f f during the wins, has showed up. But want to see that kind of continually. I'd rather have it be two and two versus, you know, oh and four. zero. Oh and yeah. four. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. How about you, Ryan? So, back off where you say, it is nice that we are two and two and mm -hmm. not own four on the year. Yeah. Um, you know, our offense is showing, but it's still only a select few. Mm -hmm. It's only our first five. Five batters are showing up. The mm -hmm. back four ain't doing anything. Yeah. There's a big jump from one person has a a uh, 250 batting average mm -hmm. and then drops from 250 to 125. Mm -hmm. That is a major difference in just four games. It, it is. You cannot win baseball that way. Mm -hmm. And then our bullpen to not look good mm -hmm. coming out. So there's nothing really I'm worried about, but it's still very early. That was something that we, I know we on the show have said, like whenever spring training was really getting started, was the bullpen was a main concern. It's good to see Bednar's, he's got two saves already in the two wins, but the bullpen itself is really just, it needs to get consistently better. And I feel like it, as the season goes on, it will get there, but it just kind of needs to, for us at least as fans, we'd like it to happen a little quicker than what it is. Mm -hmm. And then our starting pitching hasn't been real bad, except Rich Hill. I mean, obviously we knew he wasn't going to be great this mm -hmm. year because he is 40-something years old. Mm -hmm. But he did not look good at all or look anywhere close to what Rich Hill normally looks like, mm -hmm. which is very worrisome since he's supposed to be our ace. Mm -hmm. But um, with our starting rotation hasn't looked bad in the first four games, which I'm excited to see because that was one of my big things was our starting rotation, our bullpen does not look good. But at least our starting rotation – it's starting to look more consistent, more consistent. And like you said, it's still early for to see how the bullpen actually is. Mm -hmm. We're still only five games. Yeah. So bullpen probably play, each player play at least pitch one game, maybe two, three innings a game. Yeah. So really the judge of bullpen is like in a month where you can see how that bullpen actually is. Mm -hmm. For me, I think kind of what you guys are saying, it's just very inconsistent. We've only had a couple of games. Mm -hmm. It's really – I don't like judging that hard at the beginning of the seasons for any sports team because yeah. you're just getting started. You're just kind of getting your role. But we definitely need to have that – like all the batters kind of like equally up there because if we only have the first couple mm -hmm. kind of doing stuff and then our the back end's like not good, yeah. it's going to be hard to catch up because before we know it, we're going to have more losses than wins at that point. Yeah, what so they need to come up with some type of plan that, like, what can we do mm -hmm. when to I, get that? And I'll pull this straight from my dad. Like, you know, we, we were having a discussion this morning about the game yesterday since it was 13 runs combined. And we said, like, you know, it, it's their fourth and fifth stringers right now, start, like their starting pitchers. So they're not meant to be the aces. Those aren't going to be the guys that are going to go, like, six, seven strong, maybe have, like, you know, a two – at the end of the season have, like, a two ERA. You know, like, you're not getting that out of them. So – it's like you have to kind of expect that may, maybe like a little bit of a performance out of them. But, I mean, Oviedo got lit up last night, and he still went four strong. And he was lucky enough that the Pirates bats showed up in addition to him giving up hits. So I, I guess kind of be a little happy about that. But mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know as a fan if I can take that through all of the year. Yeah. Yeah, I feel the same way. I just want to highlight a couple of players real quick. Brian Reynolds, mm -hmm. this is his contract year. He got paid big time this weekend. Mm -hmm. He's looking great for not playing most spring training because of said discussions with his contract. Mm -hmm. Two home runs in one game, and then having a 3.53 batting average mm -hmm. and an OB of 3.89 is really good for not playing spring training. Yeah. And also, O'Neill Cruz is just picking up where he left off last mm -hmm. year. 
It's just exciting to see more see more of him play, not just the back half of the year, yeah. and I'm trying to see how he plays throughout the whole year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the biggest thing I'm looking for is really just how the chemistry kind of molds between the team. Because there's some pieces that are new, there's some pieces that are old. You know, McCutcheon's an older player, but he's fit in the system before. So now is he going to fit, like, really well into the system? Or are they, are they going to bring in pieces to kind of, like, you know, gel with, like, you know, make an older team? Or are they going to try and go a little younger? Are there going to be moves being made? There's still a lot up in the air. So I guess 500 through four games, and after tonight it'll be either over or under. Mm. Good start. What do you guys think about how McCutcheon's been doing the last couple of games? I, I feel like he hasn't been doing bad. I haven't. I personally have not watched too many of the games, but from what I've seen, you know, he's he's done pretty much he's been what doing I pretty good. He, he's done what I expected him to do. Mm -hmm. You know, he hasn't done. He hasn't made too many. He hasn't made. I don't think any errors out. He in has the no field. errors on the field. Yeah, he has now. no errors out in the field. So whenever the ball's getting hit to him, he's playing well there. And he's in the opening day. I think he got on base three or four times. Four in a times row. all by walks. Yeah, and, that and they said that was the, one of the first times that's happened. I think in Pirates opening day history. Yeah. I think there. There was some stat line mm -hmm. out there, so he's doing what I expected him to do. Yeah. yeah. I'll say the same thing. I mean, he's doing the same thing he did in Milwaukee. He did mm -hmm. the same thing he did for the Phillies. It's this, he's not what he was when he was the MVP for us. Mm -hmm. he, he's older now, so we're not going to see all the same stuff he did when he, when he first played for us. Mm -hmm. But in this second run of the Pirates, he's playing just like he was in Milwaukee, strong, consistent player, which I'm happy to see they stay in that yeah. way because we need that in our system yeah is he going to be our ace our star player i'm going to get criticism for this i know as soon as we walk off here no i don't think he's going to but if he can be you know a solid three four like you know, if he can lead if he can maybe be like third in batting average behind cruz and reynolds i feel like that's better than what the pirates thought was actually going to be so i mean it that could maybe start that could spark something with the team at least that's an extra bat when last season, you know, it was Reynolds, it was Cruz, and then that was about it. Mm -hmm. There really was not too many other bats in the lineup yeah. consistently. Yeah, no. I remember when I went to games last year, it was just it was just boring. It, I was just waiting for something to happen, and nothing was happening. Yeah. So I think just McCutcheon being back, playing, is just something. And it's something to look forward to. And it's the fact, very exciting to see him play because yeah. mm -hmm. I feel like what he's also going to do for this younger team, I mean, you can say, yeah, we are old, mm -hmm. but we're going to bring up our farm system mm -hmm. throughout the year. And ha if I was somebody in our farm system, in our triple A, coming up, I would want to play with Kutch because mm -hmm. Kutch knows this game in and out. And I like to see what he does with O'Neal. Yeah. Because I feel like O'Neal reminds a little bit of what Kutch was when Kutch was young, like mm -hmm. O'Neal. Yeah. So it would be very exciting to see what he does with O'Neal. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm really excited to, you know, for opening day mm -hmm. at home. At home. I'm really at excited at for opening home day opener. at home. At home opening. I'm going to watch it from my apartment. <laughs> 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 well, that is all that we have time for this week. We hope, we hope you're able to join us next week at the same Pioneer time, the same Pioneer channel, and the same Pioneer sideline. I'm Natalia Hillen, and we'll see you next week.